Good morning. I am very uh, pleased to introduce our speaker today for the Dennis Cantwell Memorial Lecture. Now, for those of you that don't know, uh, Dr. Dennis Cantwell, or, or Denny as, as we knew him, was a child psychiatrist who joined the faculty of UCLA Child Division in the mid-60s and uh, served as the training director for about 20 years um, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, Denny was a seminal figure in child and adolescent psychiatry, um, leading the way uh, with um, really amazing research and learning disabilities, communication disorders. He's probably best known for ADHD and some of the genetics and original family studies that he did. Through his work, his clinical work, his commitment to his patients, his trainees, and to UCLA, he really was the heart and soul of child psychiatry here at UCLA for many decades, and his, his spirit still infuses the halls here. Um, for those of us that had the opportunity to work with him, he really was an amazing person and certainly an international leader who shaped child psychiatry in many important ways. And we are grateful to the family for endowing this, this lectureship. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Frick, Professor the Roy Crumpler Memorial Chair in the Department of Psychology at Louisiana State University. Dr. Frick has um, a very enviable uh, CV. He has made numerous contributions to the field of child psychopathology, primarily in the areas of externalizing disorder or conduct disorders. He um, has published over 200, well over 200 papers and five books. He has an H index of 112. His papers have been cited over 63,000 times, which um, puts him at the top of almost any list of um, of child psychopathology researchers that, that we know. Um, Paul received his PhD at the University of Georgia. We were actually classmates at the University of Georgia. I've known him for a very long time um, and then went on to have positions, uh, faculty positions at the University of Alabama, the University of New Orleans, where he is a New Orleans native. And most recently he has been the Department of Psychology Chair at uh, Louisiana State University. Paul has numerous awards. I can't even begin to name all of them. He has been um, the Psychological um, Assessment Award from the Society for Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology, among others. He was the editor of the Journal of Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology, which is um, uh, the leading uh, journal in the division of in child and adolescent psychopathology. Importantly, he was a member of the DSM Task Force for Division 5, externalizing disorders, and he led the externalizing disorders um, revision for the text revision of DSM-5, uh, leading the child um, disruptive disorders, and a very long name, I'm not going to say in that. But his work has um, really changed the field in many ways. His work, he was the one of the first people to describe the concept of callous and unemotional traits, which I believe has now been changed to um, limited prosocial emotions, which is a uh, specifier in DSM-5 under conduct disorders, again, due to his work. I'm going to let him talk about his work. Um, I'm not going to go any farther, but I do want to say one other thing. Paul, come up here for a second. And Paul is a son of New Orleans. He loves Mardi Gras more than anybody else I've ever known. I've had the pleasure of spending some Mardi Gras with him. So the department thought it would be appropriate, thank you very much, to pay for your um, expenses and honorarium using Mardi Gras guilt. Wow. So here you go. I give, I, give you, I give you Dr. Frick. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Passantini. Um, this, is, show that, didn't you? You, th this is payback from your regular <laughs> attendance to the New Orleans Early Spring Conference uh, here. Um, now, what John did not take credit for was not only did we overlap at Georgia, but he was one of my first supervisors um, at Georgia. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and as he mentioned, I am going to talk about the research that we did that led to the inclusion of the limited prosocial emotion specifier in the DSM. Um, a couple important things. They told me to limit the slides to 40, and I think I have 95. So. Um, over on the left, you will see my website. Um, I have a PDF of all the um, papers that I cite here so that you can um, go in and um, find and get more detailed information than my quick um, summary of it here. Also, this is very important. All of the measures that I talk about are freely available on my website, which is why I can say 
I have no financial um, conflict of interest on, on what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I also want to thank the um, Semmel Institute, and um, it's an honor to be here um, for the um, Dennis Cantwell lecture. Um, I was in the room with Denny once. <laughs> it was during the DSM-4 field trials. Um, we were one of the field trial sites when I was in graduate school. We never talked, but from every time I, anybody I ask about Dr. Cantwell, the, the, the thing they said, he's a rabid Notre Dame football um, fan. So I think he would appreciate this slide more than a picture of him um, to honor him. Um, I think he may have mixed feelings about me being here because um, I'm at LSU that outbid Notre Dame for their football coach recently. Um, so um, I would hope that my respect for Dr. Cantwell and his evidence-based approach to um, diagnostic classification would overcome any reticence he has due to this, but I am not sure. Uh, but I do want to talk about, so I am going to talk about kind of disorder. Um, and as a quick lead in, uh, kind of disorder says a child is showing behavior problems. They um, act aggressively in ways that violate the rights of others um, in antisocial manner that violates major rules. But like most DSM disorders, it tells you nothing about why. It just says the child shows this pattern of behavior. And we have been very good about coming up with literally hundreds of dispositional risk factors, um, just as many contextual risk factors. Um, and that's very important because it does say that if you focus on any one or two, you're not gonna explain a lot of um, the variance in kind of disorder or many kids with kind of disorder. Um, it also doesn't tell you what these risk factors are doing to the developmental, uh, to the child. Um, so we have been focusing on what are the developmental mechanisms that might be affected by these many risk factors. This is important, not just for causal theory, but also for intervention. So if you know a child who is prenatally exposed to toxins are at risk for conduct disorder, very important for prevention, but if you're a, a person treating that child, you can't go back and change that. But if you know what developmental mechanisms are affected by that, you can focus your interventions there. So we have been looking to expand what has been a focus of research in juvenile delinquency for literally a century and in the uh, mental health classification for a while, the difference between childhood onset kind of disorder that starts early in life with sort of oppositional behavior that gets worse over childhood versus those that start showing severe antisocial behavior coincide with adolescent, the childhood versus adolescent onset distinction. The reason this is important, and I'm showing you this is from Terry Moffitt's Dunedin study, where they followed a whole birth cohort from the time they were born. They're actually now, I think, at age 52, but this is the outcomes at um, age 26. And what you see here is in these two orange if you look at those who had adult convictions, much higher for childhood onset than adolescent onset. And when you look at violent convictions, it was mostly the childhood onset accounting for that. And they literally had 60 or so outcomes showing this very same pattern. Convicted for DUI, you see the pattern, childhood onset worse than um, adolescent onset and violence, mostly the childhood onset. In this whole birth cohort, 95% of the con violent convictions, the convictions for violence against women were con um, done by the childhood onset, 95%. Now, I do this for two reasons. One is look at those figures down there. I am not gonna talk a lot about the adolescent onset because I am gonna start, I'm gonna talk a lot about the more enduring and more aggressive childhood onset. But I am lopping off more than half of kids with conduct disorder. When you, this is what you find in a community sample. When you look at clinic referred samples or juvenile forensic samples, it's about half and half, half childhood, half adolescence. So I'm lopping off and focusing on this group that had an enduring vulnerability. And what we were wanting to do is say, could we spot subgroups that show different developmental mechanisms leading to their antisocial behavior, building on what people were finding in adults in terms of there was a subgroup of adults with antisocial personality disorder um, that fell in the category of psychopathy. 
characterized by a lack of guilt, a lack of empathy, a poverty of emotions. And this has also been the focus of a lot of developmental research, where people have focused on how kids develop pro-social emotions. And what I wanted to do is to say, could we blend these research literatures together to come up with a subgroup of kids with childhood onset conduct disorder that was both clinically meaningful, etiologically meaningful, and also had implications for treatment. So for the first few, uh, first decade or so, uh, we focus on how to measure this. And these are the facets that have been associated with child, with adult psychopathy. And when we measured this in kids, we found, uh, and you can see one of the dimensions is the antisocial fa facet, that's conduct disorder. The other three we found in kids, we had a callous and emotional lack of empathy, lack of yoke, a narcissistic dimension and an impulsive dimension. We started focusing on that callous and emotional dimension first because it was the one that corresponded most with the developmental research on uh, pro-social emotions. But also it was the dimension that differentiated within childhood onset connoisseur. Remember, we were interested in, could we come up with subgroups of kids with childhood onset connoisseur? So look at this, this was from an early mental health clinic that um, I ran um, in, at the University of Alabama. And if you look at the two orange bars, you can see in, those are both kids who had, in our sample, that had both ADHD and either ODD and CD. Impulsivity and narcissism didn't differentiate but there was a subgroup that was also high on callous and emotional traits. This was in a group of serious adolescent offenders. Um, this was in Mount Meg's, a juvenile facility in Alabama. Um, and we coded kids who had no violent offense, had at least one violent offense and had at least one violent sexual offense. And the violent sexual offenders were the most violent overall. They showed the most predatory violence. Again, that should be impulsivity, narcissism. There was no difference. Now, if you wanted to see what dimension predicted what kids got to Mount Meg's due to a serious offense, it was impulsivity and narcissism, right? But within that group, it differentiated those that were the most violent. So we were focusing on callous and emotional traits and we took the four indicators unconcerned about the feelings of others, does not feel bad or guilty, does not care about how well they do in things, does not show emotions. And we developed three pro-socially worded items, I feel bad or guilty, and three callous items for each of those. I am concerned about the feelings of others, three pro-social, three callous, not caring about how well they do in things and not expressing emotions. And that is the inventory of callous and emotional traits. And this is available on my website. It's been translated into 28 language used in over 500 published studies. We have meta-analyses supporting its psychometric properties. We now just published a normative empirical um, uh, we cut cutoffs that clinicians can use to uh, see when a child has an elevated level of those traits. But that is the measure on all these rest of the studies I'm gonna show you that we used. So that is the callous and emotional traits we have been measuring. And what we showed with this is you could find a group of kids who are high on these traits, but the question is, but should you designate them? Is it clinically and etiologically important? So I'm just gonna give you a few examples of studies that we did showing the clinical importance. This was one of the first studies we did from an NIMH grant um, in Alabama where we screened um, kids from two school systems in Alabama and followed a group of kids who were either high on ODD and CD, according to parent and teacher report, high on ODD and CD with callous and emotional traits, according to parent and teacher report, or just high on callous and emotional traits. And look at this, the, the two orange groups are the two kids who were high on ODD and CD. You can see the group in the bright orange are the ones with most callous and are the ones that are high on callous traits were the most aggressive in school. They showed both reactive and proactive aggression. This is 
the mean was zero, so we t-scored this aggression measure, so you can see. And when we followed them over time, look at their self-reported violent offending. That was the only trajectory that differed from the control trajectory on self-reported violent offenses in a school-based sample. We replicated this in a community and mental health sample. This was a uh, study we did with colleagues at um, Case Western with a community and mental health center in um, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, you can see 566 referrals, um, typically low income Medicaid eligible um, referrals to a mental health center. And again, what we're interested in is how did kids with a diagnosis of conduct disorder differ depending on whether they were callous and emotional or not. They were more rated by their parents as being more aggressive and cruel. So again, a subgroup within the kids diagnosed with CD. We looked at a forensic sample. These were all the adolescents who were arrested for a sex offense in the state of Louisiana, was sent to a single facility um, and they were given to ICU. And so these were all the boys that had been arrested in a one year period in, that, in Louisiana. They also got, oops, uh, the um, SOAP, the J-SOAP, which is a measure of sex offending severity. The clinician rated how many victims they had, their duration of sex offense, the degree of planning that went into their sex offending, and the amount of aggressive and violence in their sex offending. Oops, got these out of order. Here's what we found. If you look at the kids who were high versus low on calcium motion traits, and this is very important, and we controlled for their overall level of antisocial behavior, their number of previous offenses. So we controlled for just, are they more antisocial? Even controlling for that, they had more victims, higher degree of planning, and more violence and aggression in their sex, offense, sex offenses. One last sample, and I'm gonna come back to this in a, in a second. This is a um, the Crossroads and Juvenile Justice Project that we've been doing with Beth Kaufman at UC Irvine and Larry Steinberg at Temple, where we've been following over 1,200 adolescents who had been arrested for the first time in either Louisiana, Pennsylvania, or California uh, for mid-range offenses. We were very interested to see wh um, whether keeping them out of the juvenile justice system enhance their outcome. It did, but I'll come to that later. What I'm showing you here is when we looked at the four years following first arrest, their level of callous emotional traits predicted their frequency of gun carrying after controlling. Look at for all the other and significant predictors that we controlled for. Again, just their lifetime offending, impulse control, exposure to violence with their peers, all of those things we control for in callous and emotional traits still predicted both gun carrying and use of gun in a crime. So what this was telling us was that it does seem to be designating a unique group of kids, either with childhood onset kind of disorder or kids who show serious offending behavior that are not captured by just general antisocial behavior. But what does it tell you about what's causing this and what do we do about that? So let's talk about the unique causal mechanisms. So if you think about the behavior genetic studies on, and you can use aggression, conduct problems, delinquency, they have been meta-analyses of the twin studies that have typically shown about 50% of the variance is due to genetics, 50% due to the environment nature and nurture. Now, I got involved with the TED study in England that was being done by Bob Plowman. And you can do a variant of that um, individual variability um, approach to twin analyses and do group heritability. <laughs> if you have over 3000 twin pairs, um, you can look at groups of disordered individual and look at how much within the this diagnostic group the symptom variation is due to genetics and environment. And if you took seven-year-old twins at the 90th percentile of, the, of a rating scale, the SDQ conduct problem scale, 
about 50% of the uh, variance was due to genes, 50% due to environment, just what you find in individual difference analyses. Look what happens when you break those twins down by based on whether they're high on callous and emotional traits or not. A very different pattern of genetic and environmental effects. For the kids that were not high on callous traits, 30% due to genes, 30% due to shared environment, 30% due to non-shared environment. For the kids high on callous and emotional traits, about 80% of the variance due to genetics. Now, I want to be very clear, and, and I know here y'all are trained by Dr. Passantini, so you know that genetics does not mean things are unchangeable um, at all. Um, it also doesn't tell you what those genes are encoding uh, there. It does tell you that there is something different going on in those two groups of kids with conduct problems, but it doesn't tell you what those genes are encoding. And we did a review for the DSM-5 few trials, um, and we reviewed about 200 studies. And here are the three most consistent differences between the kids with callous and emotional traits and those without. The kids with callous and emotional traits showed reduced responsiveness to negative emotional stimuli, especially pain and distress cues in others. They showed abnormal responses to punishment. And I know that's a very vague, like, what do you mean abnormal? I have to do that because there's a, we know that they don't respond to punishment in the same way, but there's still debate about what conditions that shows up under. Um, so we know that when they are primed for rewards, they don't respond to punishment. We know that there are certain punishment schedules, but they do show an abnormal response to punishment, and they show lower levels of fear and anxiety, particularly controlling for their level of conduct problems. I'm just going to show you one example of the study that we did in this area. We looked, we did an attentional orienting um, task. We did the dot probe task. Um, this is used a lot in anxiety research. Um, these are pictures from the International Affective Picture System, where these pictures have been uh, proven to validly differentiate um, different emotions. And don't worry, those of you who know the system, we only took the ones that have been proven safe for kids, because there are some horrendous pictures um, in that slide um, deck. Um, and we had threat pictures, distress. And I'll also tell you a funny story about uh, the positive slide there. I was given a talk, this talk in um, St. John's, Newfoundland. And I showed that picture and they stopped me and they said, how can that be a positive emotional slide? Those are ugly rats that get caught in your fishing net and they all ought to be slaughtered. And I'm thinking, it's a baby seal. <laughs> but it is a positive emotional um, stimuli every place but Newfoundland um, there. Um, and John, if you wanna be emotionally neutral all day, mushrooms on your desktop, um, on your desktop, John. <clears throat> So here is um, the dot probe task. You had a fixation point, slide flash for 250 milliseconds followed by a dot. And again, that was very fast. And we can go through why we picked 250 milliseconds. The bottom line here is what you measure is how much more quickly they recognize the location of the dot when it follows an emotional picture compared to when they follow a neutral picture in the same location. So we control for location by only doing the facilitation index for all things that on the top and all pictures on the bottom so you don't have a spatial location issue in the um, calculation. But the bottom line here is you can look at how much more quickly they orient to the dot when it follows an emotional picture. And we found no association with callous and emotional traits for positive pictures, for um, anger pictures, a modest one for threat. But what we found was we did find differences in distress pictures. This was a sample of kids of college students at UNO, and this is what we found. It was an interaction between conduct problems and callous and emotional traits, where you can see kids without conduct problems showed a normative. They were more facilitated to those uh, dots following distress pictures. But look at those with conduct problems. They actually were facilitated if they were low on callous and emotional traits, enhanced if they were high on callous and emotional traits. 
John's sitting over there saying that Paul interactions and multiple regressions are hard to replicate. So we replicated those in an adolescent detained sample. You can see a very similar um, interaction. And John's over there saying, but Paul, you're doing a person-centered interpretation from multiple regression that's dangerous to do. This is a study done by a colleague of mine, S.E. Beating. It's, it was an fMRI study looking at the right amygdala response to fearful versus calm faces in boys. So again, you could look at the difference in activity to fear and calm faces as a measure of the difference in responsiveness to those two types of faces. And what you see here is the middle bar are kids without kind of problems. Kids with kind of problems showed enhanced amygdala response. Kids with kind of problems and CU traits showed a reduced amygdala response. Again, showing you a different methodology, a different way of measuring emotional responsiveness. And I could show you some using skin conductance, um, other types, EEG, various types of emotional facilitation. But this is what I really also want to show you with this picture. Just think if you did a study comparing kids with conduct problems on their emotional reactivity to fear versus calm faces, and you lump those two kids with con groups with conduct problems together you would conclude that emotional responsiveness has nothing to do with conduct kind of problems, right? It would, wash, it would wash each other out. This is why this is important, is because you have very different emotional response. And just think about all of the neurochemical, genetic, um, uh, neurological underpinnings of emotional arousal that if you study and you group kids with conduct kind of problems together, you get washed out stuff. How's that for a technical? Denny Cantwell would love that. Um, all right, but what does this mean for what's going on with these kids? So developmentalists have long been studying that kids who lack emotional responsiveness early in life, Mary Rothbart calls them fearless kids, Jerome Kagan, Kagan called them kids with low behavioral ambition. What happens is they have trouble developing empathy of guilt because some of the early precursors to this or when a child cries, that is aversive to children. They show an emotional contagion response that motivates them to say, oh, I don't like the way this feels. What caused that? Oh, I hurt this child. I don't want to feel this way, so I'm not going to do that. That motivates them to take others' perspective. If you don't have that emotional response, it is harder, not impossible, harder for you to develop the, those perspective taking skills. It also means these kids are harder to discipline. They don't respond to parental sanctions. They ignore the potential for harmful effects on other kids. Think about if a child is, is you know, knocks another kid over and grabs a toy and the child's crying, they're thinking, yeah, but look at this toy I got. They're not thinking about, oh, this kid's crying. They're focusing on the rewards ignoring harmful effects on others. So we feel like this is the developmental net mechanism for those kids with callous and emotional traits um, who then show a more severe pattern of antisocial behavior that is more aggressive, particularly instrumental aggression. Now, remember I said that in clinic referred kids, half were adolescent, half were childhood onset? only about a quarter to a third of childhood onset show callous and emotional traits. It's the minority of kids with um, uh, childhood onset. So what does this tell you about those other kids if you take out those kids who show a different pattern of emotional reactivity? What you can guess get from those slides is these kids actually show a heightened level of emotional reactivity. They are highly distressed by their behavior and they show very high rates of impulsivity related to ADHD. In our men early mental health clinic, we also showed that they were more likely to be about one standard deviation below the mean on intelligence. And when you look at parenting, this was a sample we did in Alabama where we showed, um, we took the parenting, the how involved the parent was, how much positive reinforcement they used, how consistent they were with parenting, how well they monitored and supervised their child, and um, how harsh of parenting they used. And what we showed 
was an interaction between callous and emotional traits and parenting. Whereas, look how much stronger the parenting was related to conduct problems in kids without callous and emotional traits. It was actually unrelated to kids with callous and emotional traits. That's the top orange line. So here's the developmental mechanism for this group. You can see they could have inadequate parenting, low intelligence or highly reactive response systems, overly reactive emotional response system that leads them to act impulsively, either because they're not thinking about lacking forethought and planning, becoming too emotional aroused, and they do things that are impulsive, which they feel bad about afterwards, but they have trouble regulating their emotions and behaviors. Two very different developmental mechanisms underlying this childhood onset pathway. Now, in the rest of the time, I promise you I'll focus on diagnosis, diagnosis and um, treatment. However, I want to point out a couple things. So this parenting, people often said, look, this fits your genetic studies where you have a genetically based um, uh, pathway and an environmentally based pathway. About 10 years after we published that study, a group from Australia replicated that, our friend Mark Dads um, and his group, and showed, and they used observations of parenting and almost perfectly replicated that interaction when you looked at hostile and, uh, let's see, inconsistent and coercive parenting is the way they did this. But look at what happens if you look at parental warmth. It's actually more strongly correlated than kids high on callous and emotional traits. Now you're saying, well, how do you fit that with the genetic study? Well, you could have child effects or gene by environment interactions. In that crossroad study that we've been following the adolescents, we followed these kids over the first five years and we assessed them eight times over those five years. So we had multiple assessments where we could do this thing called random intercept cross lag panel analysis, where you can take out the overall association between callous and emotional traits and warmth. That is the overall association that cuts across all of those time points to get at how much of callous traits at the previous time point predicts changes in warmth at the next time point and vice versa. And what you see is in the sample, callous traits predicted changes in warmth, but changes in warmth did not predict callous and emotional traits. Child effects. In terms of gene by environment interactions, a colleague of mine, Luke Hyde, did a study of almost 500 adopted kids, kids who were adopted away at birth. And what he showed was that adoptive parent, no, biological parents, any social behavior was correlated with child callous traits at 27 months, even though the biological parents had no contact with the um, children, genetic effects. But look at what these two regression lines show you. When you measure the adoptive parents' use of positive reinforcement, parents, adoptive parents who used high rates, that's the dotted line, there was less of an association between the biological parents' antisocial behavior and the child's callous traits. The adoptive uh, environment moderated that genetic risk. Last thing I wanted to show you. So I made the point here in terms of parent. Remember when I said, if you group together those two patterns of emotional responsivity, just think about the same thing with parenting here. If you just looked overall in the sample, and I'll tell you, the correlation between parenting overall in the sample was 0.21. It was significant, but you would underestimate the effects of parenting for the kids without callous traits, overestimate it for the kids high on callous traits. What if that's the case for other policy important um, variables, like our crossroad sample, where we showed that adolescents who were kept out of the juvenile justice system did better in terms of less self-reported offending later on, less re-arrest later on. I could go through a whole bunch of ways they were better when we kept them out of the system, but we'll, let's focus on those. 
But look at what happens when you consider callous and emotional traits. Those, the first two sets for self-reported offending and re-arrest across the time period, you can see dramatic effects where the formerly processed youth reported more self-reported offending, had more arrest, but there was no difference in the callous and emotional group, this last group. So look at what we're saying here is we actually underestimated the harmful effects of putting kids in jail by not considering that a third of them showed high callous traits that were not as sensitive to that environmental effect. Very important for interpreting policy um, information. So what does this mean for diagnosis? Because of this, um, the DSM-5 decided we needed to make a distinction within the childhood onset group. And this is where we got the specifier with limited prosocial emotions. You can see it is, they have two or more of these symptoms. And again, over 12 months in multiple relationships and settings. And it basically are the four items that led to the development of the ICU. A lack of remorse and guilt, a callous lack of empathy, and you can see a little extended description of this. Unconcerned about performance and important activities and shallow and deficient affect. Two or more and a child with kind of disorder is shown um, limit, with limited prosocial emotion specifier. The WHO adopted this for the ICD with the same name. The only difference is you can use it for both ODD and CD, opposition defiant disorder in the ICD. It has the same four core symptoms plus a relative indifference to the probability of punishment. So it is included in the major diagnostic classification systems now. So one of the things we've been doing most recently is we develop, because many clinical settings can't rely just on rating scales to make a diagnosis, we have developed a clinician assessment um, system called the CAPE, the Clinical Assessment of Prosocial Emotions which is a structured professional judgment clinician rating. We give very specific um, descriptions of the four symptoms that need to be rated on a zero, one, two, scale, one, two, three scale. Um, they get standard training and we have semi-structured interviews that guides the clinicians on the questions to ask. And again, this is on my website. And when clinicians are asking, so what do I look for clinically? I send them to our manual of the CAPE and the unstructured interview as a, a guide to how to assess this in their samples. We've now had um, validated this and detained um, samples in Spain, clinic preferred children. And just to give you, here's the reliability and validity um, in our sample um, at LSU. This is our training clinic here. We did 97 kids and we did inter-rater reliability for 72 of those 90. Um, kids. And you can see overall in terms of whether they met criteria, very high Cohen's cap of 0.85. The ICC, very high at 0.85. And all of the symptoms showed pretty good internal um, inter-rater reliability. Very important for a clinician rating that gives a lot of leeway to the clinician to make the rating. And this is how well it predicts outcomes controlling for the ICU. So a quicker assessment rating, you can see predicted outcomes on five of the seven measures. And we looked at within kids with ODD and CD, those that met criteria according to the CAPE showed more CD symptoms, showed more proactive and reactive aggression and more aggression overall. So again, some validity support this clinical assessment. But what about treatment? So I started this talking about risk factors and um, we need to, kind of, to focus on multiple risk factors. But what we're showing with this is you also need to be individualized with treatment. Now, fortunately, we have some programs that can address the adolescent rebellion of the adolescent onset group. And we actually have a number of good parenting interventions, good anger control um, interventions that we probably underestimate their effectiveness because we're using them for some kids who don't need that. What do we do for the kids with callous and emotional traits? 
And this is a meta-analysis that was just published in Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry by uh, Sam Perlstein and Becky Waller of 60 studies that showed that when you look at callous and emotional traits, they did not moderate treatment effectiveness. These kids were just as, you know, they did not change the effectiveness of, treat, of, of these various treatments. However, kids with callous and emotional traits started treatment worse, responded to treatment, and still ended treatment worse. Does that make sense? So it was actually a severity indicator. This is critically important because this says these kids are not untreatable. They do respond to many treatments. We just need to do something more. Um, and the treatments did not reduce the level of CU traits overall. I'm just gonna show you one of these treatments that was included in the mental analysis that we did in Louisiana. This was at a community mental health center where we, we tested functional family therapy of 134 adolescents referred. And you can see uh, these were consecutive referrals. This was an uncontrolled trial um, where we just showed that callous and emotional traits actually showed the strongest response. That's what this treatment chain shows you is particularly for parent rated aggression and conduct problems, kids with callous and emotional traits showed the largest response. And if you look at their re-arrests during treatment, during six months after treatment and during 12 months, the kids with callous emotional traits controlling for their level of conduct problems were more likely to be re-arrested for violent charges, but it decreased post-treatment. They're treatable. But this is what that meta-analysis showed you. Despite the fact that the kids changed the most, in aggression and conduct problems, they still ended treatment with the highest ratings of conduct problems. So this is what we have been doing with treatments is to take evidence-based treatments like parent-child interaction therapy. It's a parent management program that is done with young kids. It's been shown to be very effective for kids with uh, conduct problems. And we showed just what the Perlstein meta-analysis showed, just what we showed in functional family therapy, kids with callous and emotional traits do come out better. They still come out worse than other kids with conduct problems. So a student of mine, Eva Kimonis, um, has developed a variant of that called Parent-Child Interaction Therapy CU. She developed it very systematically. She, she did a lot of focus groups. She did case studies and then a few years, and, and what she did, she enhanced it using the research on callous traits by enhancing what PCITRE does to help parents develop more warmth, emotional, responsive parenting. It focused even more on shifting emphasis away from punishment to reward to change behavior. And this is big. It added six sessions of emotional coaching. Parents were taught how to stop their child, teach them how to pay attention to others' emotions, and then use the warm, reward-oriented parenting to encourage the child's use of those skills. And in our first uncontrolled test of 23 families, we showed that it decreased, and these are all kids with both C elevated CU traits and kind of problems. It showed decreased conduct problems as well as empathy. Remember, that didn't respond to typical treatments with pretty large effects from pre to post treatment that were maintained 70, uh, three months after treatment. And 75% of the kids three months past treatments no longer had clinically significant conduct problems. And we finally published our first randomized control trial of PCIT. This was, we just published in 2022. Now, I'm not going to go through this whole randomization, but the bottom line here is we randomly assign kids to, and it end up with 20 kids in the standard PCIT, 22 kids in the PCIT CU group. And again, these are a bunch of outcome measures. And what I'm going to show you here is you can see both groups responded pretty well during treatment. And in fact, we didn't find significant differences during treatment. But look at what happened at follow-up on most of these measures. The kids that got the PCITCU maintained their treatment at follow-up. All right. So I know I went a little bit over. 
I want to thank my funders, but here is the bottom line summary. What we've tried to do is to say, look, these kids with conduct problems show a number of different mechanisms leading to their conduct problems. Sometimes they can be opposing levels of emotional reactivity. They can be opposing uh, correlates with, cor uh, with social correlates like parenting, that if you don't separate them, you don't get a good picture of what are the key causal mechanisms underlying their behavior. So it's important diagnostically because it also helps you to tailor treatment to their individual needs. Our kids with callous and emotional traits do respond to treatments like functional family therapy in adolescence, like PCIT in, ch in children, but we need to enhance them with what we know about their behaviors. And that's what we've been doing and will be continuing to do for the next, at least for the rest of my career, um, trying to test out better and better enhancements. Bob McMahon, another colleague of ours, is testing out, he developed the Helping the Non-Compliant Child. He now has a Helping the Non-Compliant Child CU version. So this is where we're going with this. And again, I wanna thank my primary funders for, what I, for my work here. And thank you for being here. All right, John, I think you were handling the question. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it over here because I don't know if you can see the questions on you. I cannot see the screen, questions. So I have the questions here. Uh, Paul, that, this was an amazing talk. Danny, Danny would have loved this. Yeah. It was systematic. It looked at the interactions between environment and biology, nature versus nurture. And it it was it was a very, very systematic approach. Um, to this, to this vexing question. I, I think it's just an amazing body of work. You know, those of us that work with depression or anxiety or some of these other disorders, it seems like a walk in the park compared to the work that you're doing, but um, this is incredibly critical work. I, I'm gonna, there's a, there's a number of questions. I'm gonna take the first question. Okay. And um, you talked about maternal warmth as, yes. a, as a predictor. I'm thinking with 80% genetics mm -hmm. that, that one or both parents has callous and emo unemotional traits mm -hmm. as well. And have you looked at the correlation and then you, and then more specifically maybe with fathers, because I, I I'm thinking modeling mm -hmm. and whether warmth may have been a proxy for modeling, but maybe you can talk a little bit about some of these environmental influences that might've been shaped by family genetics. Uh, absolutely. And that sort of goes back to both the adoption study that we talked about, as well as the child effects. They're there. But also, John, this is what happens in most types of childhood psychopathology. Take anxiety. Anxious kids are more likely to have anxious parents. And so they typically need parents who model non-anxious behavior, but they're not likely to get that naturally. They tend to have parents who tend to paint a picture of the environment as being threatening and of concern. So this is the same thing with callous and emotional traits in kids is what happens is they probably have a genetic risk and they could overcome that genetic risk as the adoption study showed you if they have parents who do more warm and responsive parenting that's hard to come by naturally because these kids evoke less warmth from parents and they're less likely to have parents so this is why intervention is so important is because they are set up to have a genetic risk and to have environments that don't give them the corrective environment that um, they need to overcome it. And that's why in our interventions, we try to put that in. Yeah, I imagine everybody or many in, in, in the room live and in the um, online as I was just screaming early intervention, early intervention, yeah, and then absolutely. you showed the slides. So I think that's really great. You're, you're one step ahead of everybody with this work. And again, this is what, you know, I spent a good bit of the previous decade working in the juvenile justice system and working at, as you can see, in the we did functional family therapy. We made sure it was more available so that kids who were diverted from the system had something. But you're absolutely right. I became, it became very clear is, look, I want to focus on keeping them out of the system to begin with. That's early intervention. Great. Well, we have 10 questions oh, online yeah. and there may be some questions from this group. I'm going to start with the online questions and maybe we can move through them at some pace. Um, some of these may be specific. They came in in response to specific slides. Okay. The first is, um, 
did teacher and parent reports correlate? <laughs> and this came in about, about 10 minutes into yeah. the talk. Uh, probably I was talking that most with the aggressive behavior. <laughs> it correlated about as much as they usually do, about 0. 0.30. So um, that means they share 9% of the variance. Um, so they were correlated about that that much. Mm -hmm. now, that's about the same for other. Yep. Um, yeah. Now, in the Cleveland study, yep. were families mostly single parents? Oh, um, it was a very low income community mental health sample. Um, I don't want to say I, I, I don't remember. So I'm going to have to uh, say again, I do know that they were mostly par uh, families who are in med public assistance um, in the community mental health center. I don't remember the proportion that were single parents. Here's a very timely question. Um, what about school shooters? Have you done any work with them to see where they, where they land on this continuum? Um, not exactly school shooters, but we have done a lot of studies on bullying, you know, which people have related to school um, shootings. And callous and emotional kids, it, it's very interesting. We, we had, I had a rash of students who were very much interested in bu bullying. Overall, callous and emotional predict, predicts bullying even over above conduct problems themselves. So it was one of the types of aggression that callous and emotional kids were more likely to show than other kids with conduct problems. It even got more interesting is because we did a number of studies looking at the ones who are both bully alone and bully victims. And the kids with callous and emotional traits were usually the ones who were more bully alone and not the bully victims. The bully victims tended to be the ones who had kind of problems without callous traits. Um, and the final part to that is when we looked at things like who encouraged bullies, who reinforced bullies, that's where the prediction of callous and emotional traits was the strongest. These kids with callous and emotional traits actually played into the bully. So the reason I put that is we know that bullying is related to school shootings in a lot of cases. And so we know if callous and emotional traits contributes to a climate that encourages bullying, it will be, you know, it, it, it is at least indirectly related to that. Um, what's the status of the original theory that conduct disorder kids were under aroused and used thrill seeking mm -hmm. as a way of raising their level of arousal? And to me, that really hits why that was a theory, but it had very inconsistent support. A lot depend on what you use to study arousal, the sample, all of this. And again, I think that goes back to, we have two different patterns of arousal um, related to that. And so we do feel like there are some kids who are under aroused and again, we could theorize that they do things to come up with optimal level of arousal. But for us, it seems to be they're missing the motivation to take other people's perspective. Whereas for other kids, they're actually over aroused and that makes it hard for them to regulate. And so again, um, what we're thinking is we can't just say, is this type of arousal or emotional reactivity or anything related to emotional processing, is it related to conduct problems? we have to look at how it's differentially related. That's good. Um, we have a couple more um, questions online. I do want to give people in the room a question. Uh, Carolee? Um, I can wait till the training, so if anybody in here's training wants yeah. to ask, but I have so many, I wrote down so many questions <laughs> that I could probably take them all. Okay, well, uh, let's go in the back. Yeah, I was just wondering about the differences between uh, the uh, the interventions, uh, mm -hmm. the parent-parental interaction therapy, and the CBO therapy. Okay, so three cardinal differences. So again, we take the we take the standard PCIT because remember that is effective. Um, we started out with an effective treatment, um, and then we enhanced it by first coaching, teaching parents how to be more warm and responsive range from things like how to tell their child, I love you, how to make eye contact when you tell your child, I love you, different ways of promoting warmth. We then beefed up the PCIT focus on rewards. Now again, anybody who does PCIT said, well, Paul, you do that anyway. Yes, you do. But you do that even more in our PCIT um, CU. And then the big thing is you have six extra sessions of emotional coaching. 
where the parents teach the child how to pay attention, how to stop, pay attention to other kids' emotions, and then you reinforce them for doing that. Those are the big, the big differences. And if you go to Eva Kimonis's website at the University of New South Wales, she has manuals, chapters that will spell this out for a clinician way better than I just did. Mm. Way better. Uh, Emily. Uh, yes. I actually just had a question uh, mm -hmm. about imaging literature. And if, if you've seen any overlap between uh, these kids with, I guess, limited pro-social emotion and uh, children with autism. Yeah. Excellent question. Um, I can't say from the imaging literature, but from the theory of mind literature, um, in the sense that there are a number of um, groups in the UK compared kids with callous and emotional traits and um, uh, autism spectrum disorder. The kids with autism spectrum disorder did awful on theory of mind tasks. The kids on callous and emotional traits had no problems with theory of mind tasks. The kids with autism actually became aroused to other people in distress. They had no idea why, but it bothered them. Whereas the kids with callous and emotional traits did not become aroused. So one is that autism seems to be one more of theory of mind and different deficits in cognitive empathy. Whereas the callous and emotional traits seems to be one more of, of the emotional reactivity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I'll try to limit to one or two. Okay. But, um, so this really made me think a lot because I have pretty limited experience with conduct disorder and, and the experiences that I've had um, have been mainly um, working in the emergency room in a public hospital mm -hmm. and kids who come in from juvenile hall. Mm -hmm. So they, um, they were in a specific situation. They had committed some or perpetrated some sort of offense um, that's one group, mm -hmm. and then in my current job now, I work doing consultations with foster care kids in Los Angeles, and the ones that I see, 100% of them have been um, exposed to toxins in utero mm -hmm. and brutally abused in some way and neglected. Mm -hmm. So one question is, did you look at that slice of life who were brutally abused and then kind of became victim perpetrators mm -hmm. and are how does that affect um you know feeling feelings yep um excellent question and we we, we have looked at that because if you look at the effects of abuse you actually see pr some divergent results of that there are some kids who develop a hostile attributional bias because they always have to be aware because they always have to be on alert. They've been abused. Everything's a threat in the environment. And so they have a hostile attribution of violence making them overreactive. Then you have some kids who through chronic abuse become desensitized to that. And so we theorize that abuse could lead to both of these pathways. And the, the important thing then is to say, okay, you probably want to treat those two kids a little differently. One, you have to teach them how to regulate their emotions, how to overcome a hostile attributional bias. The others, you have to come up, you know, again, motivate them to pay attention to the feelings of others, even though they become desensitized to that. So in our, our one test of this, we actually found more evidence for the overreactive response and hostile attributional bias in the non-callous kids to reactive aggression. Um, but we do know that it can lead to the underreactive too. We have time for just one more question, and I want to. I, I have okay, one. Can I ask one more quick? Um, do you consider um, callous and unemotional mm -hmm. a static trait or a dynamic one? So, for example, suicidality. Yep. It goes up on in certain moments, mm -hmm. and sometimes it, it leads to completing suicide. Unemotional and callous. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, is that something you can measure as a static trait and do they tell the truth? Yeah, um, that last part is really interesting. Actually, we find that self-report is the most predictive okay. and they, do, they don't see that as, a, they don't see these traits as a negative thing. Okay. So we actually found even as young as age nine, the self-report seems to be the most, um, most valid. Okay. Um, the other to that, you know, it is, as stable as other things. So for example, it's correlated about 0.30 from childhood to young adulthood. 
That means there's a lot of change that can happen, but there is some continuity. So again, we wanna say that it is not unchangeable as people would often say about psychopathy. You can change it and treatments can change it, but it is something that puts kids at risk for serious outcomes. We have one more question because we're a little bit over, but I uh, appreciate everybody staying on. Um, the diagnosis of conduct disorder in general seems to be highly stigmatizing mm -hmm. and tends to be used by the justice system to justify punishment. Oh. So what are your recommendations in this area to, to address this? Sure. And, and again, in the, it, it, is, it can be highly stigmatizing, but the, the most important thing is we have really worked to say, these kids come from awful homes and, you know, we don't want to um, put them as, you know, arrest them and put them in the juvenile justice system. We want to make it clear that they have a mental health problem that deserves treatment. And so, yes, it's stigmatizing because it says they show a pattern of antisocial behavior, but there's actually been a, dumb, a number of studies that show that the diagnosis of conduct disorder, while it does have some negative um, connotations, it actually leads judges to um, make more recommendations for treatment um, than if a kid was just said they're antisocial and delinquent and did all these things. So we, you know, it is like any mental health label. It can come, we have to guard against, we got to educate against the stigmatizing um, part of the label and make it to where this is designed to get kids treatment. The reason we do, I, I do this is because I want these kids not to be sent to jail, but to be sent to met for mental health treatment. And even when they do get sent to jail for something, they still deserve mental health treatment and we have effective mental health treatments. Thank you. Um, we're about five minutes over and I, I, uh, I've got a respect for people that need to go, including Dr. Dr. Frick. I think we'll um, hold off on the questions. Um, there, there are a few left. Feel free to email Dr. Frick. Absolutely. And to the hundred people that are here and online, I'd like you to know that Dr. Frick has extended an invitation to stay with him for next Mardi Gras. So I can give you his address. So, um, but but, but as you now. see, the dress code is very strict. Um, so you need to get some good swag um, yeah. if you're going to do that. Um, I'd just like to thank you again. This was an amazing, amazing talk. I mean, you, you've kept a spell down for for quite a while. And this is not something we hear a lot about. Um, and so your research is so incredibly important. And again, I think you're just an ideal candidate for the Cantwell Lecture. Thanks, so John. Thank you very much.